Hello, everyone. My name is Connor Marr. I'm a design engineer at Rotary Wing Engineering, and I am joined today by Luke Webble, and I'm a scientist in materials and process engineering. And we've got what hopefully will be an exciting presentation for you. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about uh, our elastomers and how they're used and hopefully give you some insight behind the secret sauce of what we do. So we're going to be talking to you today about what is an HCL and why we use elastomers in them, giving you some of the details of why elastomer bearings are important. Then Luke is going to talk to you a bit about SPE2A and go into the details of this elastomer, the upgrade, and how we deal with elastomers in our process. Then we're going to get into some exciting case studies that show you how the SPE2A improvement uh, really plays out in real parts. And lastly, we're going to talk a bit about how the SPE2A elastomer is incorporated into parts that are currently in the field and some things that may be coming up soon. Feel free to join the conversation on Twitter. You can see the hashtag on the right-hand side of your screen there. We'll begin by going over what is an HCL. This is a typical rotor hub, which includes multiple main rotor bearings, spherical bearings, conical bearings. These bearings are vital to the operation of your aircraft. Uh, they allow your blades to flap, lead lag, and of course, uh, be able to put in the pitch motions into your blades, which gives you control of your aircraft. You can see here that this is an HCL bearing embedded within the hub of an aircraft. Now, I'm sure all of you know that it's very important to maintain these very well. So we're going to go to our first poll question. Have you received training on how to properly inspect an HCL bearing? And please respond with a yes or a no. Let's go into a bit more detail on what exactly is an HCL. HCL stands for high capacity laminate. Basically what it means is you have a bunch of shims, so you have elastomer, metal, elastomer, metal, and they allow you to be able to take much higher loads while still allowing you to remain compliant in the key directions. If you think of a standard isometric material, it doesn't matter which way you pull it, it's gonna have similar behaviors. Well, because of the HCL design, you can be incredibly stiff in the axial direction, but you can be very soft in the torsion direction and also allow motion in your caulking direction, which is your flat and your lead lag. This design is at the key of allowing our HCL bearings to work and for allowing many helicopters to be able to function properly. But for an HCL to work the way that we want it to, there's a key aspect, a key material, and that material is the elastomer. And Luke is going to go into a bit more detail about why the elastomer is important and what we can do to design the best elastomers. Thanks, Connor. So you may be wondering, why do we use elastomers in our parts? So elastomer allows movement while still providing the stiffness that is needed for operation. And using elastomeric bearings also allow for an on-condition inspection so that parts only have to be replaced when they can no longer perform their intended functions. Bearings that have undergone less severe fatigue during operation can last even longer than expected lifetimes. Predictable and gradual fatigue of our elastomer allows replacement of bearings before catastrophic failures can occur. Elastomers also have resistance to environmental conditions that can be adverse for hard bearings and do not require internal lubrication. Sand, dust, dirt, and many other environmental conditions have little to no effect on elastomers. We can formulate them to resist the environmental conditions that are seen by your aircraft at elevated temperatures in cold environmental conditions or even exposure to some of the different fluids that are used when cleaning and maintaining your aircraft. Hey Luke, weren't elastomers really developed in the tire industry and isn't that the main area that you see them? Thanks Connor. So while tires are originally uh, the primary users of natural rubber and still remain to be the highest volume users today, elastomers have found applications in many other more diverse areas. For example, they can be used as highly engineered aerospace materials in our parts. They can be used for weather stripping and sealing applications in doors or, or windows. In automotive industries, they can be used for hoses and tubing and many, many other applications, similar to our Lord mounts, which we also produce to isolate motion. 
As elastomers are highly engineered materials, they contain a large diversity of ingredients. You can see in the photo to the bottom right that there are three separate polymers in front with a handful of ingredients behind them. Any elastomeric recipe can contain between six and 20 or more ingredients, and there are over 2,000 ingredients to choose from, with many more being developed or utilized on a regular basis. The properties of elastomers are controlled by the formulation, and they can vary between wanting to control stiffness, damping, extend fatigue life, uh, develop environmental resistance, to adjust the processing conditions for easier manufacturing, to reduce aging of elastomers, and all of these can be adjusted by making changes to the chemistry of the rubber. So where does natural rubber actually come from? Natural rubber and latex is typically harvested from Hevia brasiliensis trees, but can also be obtained from trees of other families, such as the ficus or sepotasia family. And even the common dandelion can be used to harvest latex in small quantities. A rubber tree after being planted takes up to seven years before it begins to produce latex, which can then be harvested, processed, and shipped. Rubber trees can only be grown within 10 degrees of the equator, so they are typically grown in southeastern Asia or South America in large plantations. Parker Lord audits are scheduled on a regular basis to visit plantations and ensure that they meet quality standards. Natural rubber can then be taken from the tree, harvested, produced into latex, processed, and shipped to our facilities, where we then mix it into our elastomer formulations, mold it into parts, and ship it to our customers. Luke, how can you take something that's coming from the natural world, from a tree, and ensure that it meets the quality requirements that we have making parts? So thank you, Connor, for that question. After the natural latex is harvested from the trees, it can be separated into various grades and processed into the natural rubber that we use today. There are many different processes which natural rubber undergoes, uh, such as straining to reduce the amount of insects, dust, and dirt that's in the elastomers, and also sorting it into different grades, depending on the viscosity of the elastomer. There are also different ways of processing the material, such as making smoked rib sheets, which smells exactly as you would think it does by taking the elastomer sheets and literally putting it into a smokehouse for a couple of days to a few weeks to get different properties. We use uh, high strained grades that are very, very clean for our aerospace application. So what is SPE-2A? SPE-2 is originally a very, very good engineering material that was developed over 40 years ago with the best technology of the time that we had to offer. And over time, we realized that with newer chemistries and more modern techniques, we could enhance that elastomer by adding in new and critical formulation improvements. These improvements increased the fatigue life, generated a more consistent fatigue life, reduced the heat generation of the parts, and created more flexibility for design engineers by improving the range of use of the compounds. We also managed to make adjustments to the chemistry that allowed for slower deterioration due to heat effects by not only reducing the heat generation of the parts during operation, but also improving the high temperature resistance. These critical design improvements give more flexibility to design engineers so that they have less challenges to work around to giving you the parts that you need for your various applications. Luke, as a design engineer, uh, I would like to say thank you to you and the materials team for doing that. Uh, I know it's definitely come in handy. I also know that these improvements were not made in a vacuum. Uh, they were made with a lot of input from the design teams collected from tons of service history to try to create a material that behaves exactly as we want it to as Luke said, to give us more options for our end users and customers. Thanks, Connor. We're always happy to help. With all of us talking about this SPE-2A elastomer, we wanted to launch our second poll question and ask the audience, have any of you heard of SPE-2A prior to this presentation? Please answer yes or no. Up to this point, you've heard about how we design our bearings at a very high level. You've heard about our elastomeric materials, and you've also learned about how SPE-2A really gives you an improvement over the legacy material. You're probably asking yourself, that's all nice and good to hear, it makes sense, 
but can you show me that this is really true? Well, that's what we've got for you here. We have three case studies on three different parts showing side by side what an improvement SPA 2A can give in a real application. Over these next few slides, you're going to see details on this. But in general, there's been a 30% or greater increase in expected service life of these parts by introducing SPE 2A into the bearings. Our first case study is the Bell 407 CF bearing. Here you can see our engineering test lab. We have a dedicated machine set up to run two parts side by side. One is the legacy SPE 2 bearing, and the other one is our new SPE 2A bearing. These have the same exact representative fatigue spectrum put into the parts, and they were run until one of them reached its removal criteria. What you can see here is a comparison of the life. Um, in red, you have the SP2A, and in blue, you have the SP2. As we began to run this part, they started off in the same spot and the same stiffness. That's exactly as you'd expect. But as the life continued, there is a very clear drop-off in the SP2 bearing. This corresponded with the life that you'd expect for the legacy part. You can see here a comparison at that removal criteria. On the left is the SP2 bearing. You can see it looks pretty beat up. And if you're familiar with maintaining these parts, you know that this has reached the removal criteria. There are cracks, there's crumbing. Uh, it's obviously a part that should be taken off of your aircraft. While on the right-hand side, you see the SP2A bearing. This one still looks like new, and you can see not only does it look like new, but it's still performing like new. On the chart in red, the SP2A has not dropped in stiffness at all. In fact, as you can see here, it didn't reach its removal criteria until 1.75 times the life of the original part, a very significant increase, and that results in direct savings to the end user, to you, the operators and maintainers. This part can be left on the aircraft longer. It's an on-condition replacement. That means if this bearing is still behaving as it should, it has not reached the removal criteria, then you're able to keep flying with this. Our second case study is the Bell 412 pivot bearing. In this one, we actually were comparing a competitor part to an improved Lord part. Uh, the Parker Lord SP2A part, you can see on the right-hand side here, these are compared at the end of life for the competitor part. Similar to the previous test, we ran both parts side by side, same spectrum, until one part reached its removal criteria. When it did, we took out the parts and did a full inspection. The new SP2A 412 pivot bearing that we had designed was behaving almost like new whereas the competitor part had very clearly reached its end of life condition. Uh, you can see in that picture on your left, there's evident crumbing and there's actually extrusion of, uh, of the elastomer as well. Okay, now on to our last case study. This is the Bell 407 shear bearing. This is a fun one because we actually have a video. Uh, we have videos set up side by side while we were running this test, uh, running throughout the entire test. You can see this is the very beginning. On the left-hand side is the competitor bearing. On the right-hand side is the Parker Lord bearing. And you can see them running side by side throughout the test. Uh, damage is evident here on this competitor part. There's very clear crumbing. Again, anyone used to maintaining these aircraft will be familiar with this degradation mode. We have a couple stills so that you can clearly see that the damage is beginning in the competitor part. And by the end of the test, the competitor bearing had reached removal criteria. You can see here a chart that compares the stiffness both started out in about the same place. The competitor part eventually died off at the end and reached its removal criteria. Our next slide here actually has a bit more detail. This is just a still, but what it shows you is that at the start of the test, zero hours, we had a Lord part and a competitor part on. This was an accelerated spectrum, meaning that this is not exactly representative of how long the part should last on your aircraft but it is a way to get a quick fatigue life of a part. So after 465 hours on test, the competitor bearing had actually reached its removal criteria. Meanwhile, the Lord part still looked like new. So we decided let's put on a second competitor bearing and run that side by side. We put that in at 465 hours on the Lord part and we continued to run. 
That second competitor part actually only lasted 46 test hours before it had reached its removal criteria. The Lord part ended up going to almost 900 test hours with still no evident fatigue damage. At that point, we decided to end the test because really it was supposed to be a side-by-side. -side. Uh, we had outlasted two competitor parts and still looked like new and had very little stiffness drop off. So once again, a very, very clear demonstration of how the SP2A material has greatly increased the fatigue life of our parts. It's really great to see that these elastomer improvements are actually working. What are some ways that I can get these improvements on my parts? Luke, the good news is that if you currently operate a Bell 407 or 412 platform, many of the parts have already been upgraded to SP2A. You can see on the bottom of your screen here, a bunch of the parts that already have SPA2A incorporated into them. Uh, this has been done over the past few years to help our customers get the maximum life out of their parts. The even better news is that over the next two years, we have multiple upgrades coming out. So if you operate a platform that you don't see on this page, keep your ears open for announcements coming out from Lord about new parts, new PMAs, new repairs. Uh, we're very excited for some of these new offerings. I unfortunately cannot tell you which platforms they are right now, but I can tell you that we're almost through the approval on a couple of them. So keep yours open. Exciting stuff is coming very soon. With that in mind, we'd like to go to our next poll question. Where do you go when you need to replace your bearings? Do you currently go to Parker Lord? Do you go directly to the OEM? Or is there another place that you go? And if you do choose the other option, if you feel comfortable, please let us know in the chat. So how are we able to make these new parts, make these new materials and really improve our designs? Well, it's because we're co-located in one facility with our design engineering, materials processing team, production teams, repair teams, and our one of a kind engineering test lab. Uh, having everyone in one building has allowed for some really incredible innovation, and we're able to come up with new designs and interact with the materials team to come up with the exact elastomers that we need. Luke, do you want to mention anything that you've seen in the past about this great interaction? So, thank you, Connor. As an elastomer formulator, I really enjoy getting use out of the state-of-the-art elastomer formulation lab that we have here. We have a one and a half liter lab mixer, and we also have testing capabilities for all of our standard rubber properties, such as rheology, compression set, tensile testing, environmental testing, fluid resistance, aging, and fatigue in a variety of different modes. All of these internal capabilities we have on the lab scale can also be scaled up onto our production line as well. Being able to work together with design during the development process of new materials is invaluable being able to get input from engineers along the way for different requirements they may need or upcoming projects that we can incorporate into ongoing discoveries about new materials. I know that I personally have taken advantage of that multiple times through many of my designs. So it's very exciting to be able to work together. And you can see on the bottom right of the picture there is our engineering test lab. Once we go through all the material development, we go through the analytics, we go through our modeling, we're then able to put these parts on test. And you saw that previously in the case studies that we can replicate what actually happens to these bearings on aircraft. And that's because this test lab allows us to create unique machines to do just that. That gives us the ability to verify how these things are gonna behave in the field and get them approved for flight. And lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about our repair station. Uh, we have a state-of-the-art repair station. If you have not checked out the video, uh, the webinar on the repair station, please do so. You can see the link at the bottom here. It's on YouTube, or you can search on YouTube for Lord Corporation MRO. This is a fantastic video that goes into a lot of detail about what happens when a part comes in, how we can hit our three-day turnaround times, how we provide AOG support, and how we're able to make sure that we're giving the best services to our customers who use our repair station. Some of the key takeaways that we'd like for you to walk away with today is that our HCLs use a highly engineered elastomeric material that is designed specifically to perform for the purposes of the parts that we produce for you. We'd also like you to walk away with the knowledge that our SPE2A elastomer greatly improves 
our legacy elastomers extends fatigue life, reduces heat generation, and gives a better overall experience with our products. You've also seen how side-by-side comparative tests have shown very clearly that the SPA-2A has created improvements on real parts. And some of these life improvements are very significant. Additionally, SPA-2A upgrades are already in place on a bunch of the Bell 407 and 412 parts. Uh, but there's other upgrades coming very soon, so keep your ears open for those. At its essence, SPA-2A has allowed us to really expand our design envelope and provide better parts for you, the end users. Thank you very much for your attention today. Hopefully you learned something, and now we're very excited to take any questions that you've got and try to do our best to give you good answers.